thanks everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guest is a writer and director known for some of the absolute greatest comedy movies and TV shows there are. Shows like Seinfeld, Curb Your Enthusiasm, movies like Borat and Bruno. And now Larry Charles is searching some of the most dangerous places in the world for laughs. Here is a look at Larry Charles' dangerous world of comedy. It's a dangerous world filled with hate and violence and war and amazingly enough, Comedy. When you are not funny, you are what in English? You are not funny. <laughs> <laughs> Can you make a living as a comic in Iraq? Helping people forget they live in a war zone. How do you break into comedy in Somalia? Cool, Look, yes. No, Google it. Please, Google it. It takes brave people to make dangerous comedy. It's a therapy. The little laughter takes away the stress. Risking their lives just to make people laugh. You said that. I didn't say that. <laughs> Comedians and actors and TV and filmmakers who make comedy in places where it doesn't belong. Get people to laugh just a little about that which might be the most sacred. Then we might get them to open up a little bit. You discovered your comic sensibility as a tool for survival. If you talk to a Western equivalent, it's like, oh, I did a little show for my grandparents, or I was in a talent show at school. Spoiled, spoiled. Right. It's <laughs> we live our lives. We like doing our nails, too. I'm making a statement. Yeah. Yeah. I will do a genocide joke, but it will be well-crafted. Veterans have a sixth sense humor. That's how we deal with the job we got to do. Right. I mean, girls know this, but you know, once you go cooked, you're hooked. <laughs> Everybody, please welcome the great Larry Charles. Let's hear it. Thank you. How are we doing here? Mike's okay? We're all good? Everybody? We're okay, yeah, okay, I think good. it sounds great. Uh, Larry, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, uh, thank I'm you. such a massive fan of yours, you know. Uh, I love this series, and I was telling you while I was playing how much I, I went and watched some Borat right after, and I was, I was shocked at how much I was still laughing at scenes from that movie. It's thank one you. of those things that thank just... Thank you. I think it'll live on forever. It's one of the funniest things ever it'll made. It'll be a very. It would be a very different movie today, but uh, I'm True. glad that it's uh, it still works for you, and that's great. Do you think it doesn't work for for some people, or do you think for for reason it doesn't work? Well, for instance, I was in Nigeria for this show, and there is a rampant uh, rape culture there. Mm. Um, rape is. Uh, Tolerated, it's it's discussed uh, uh, openly and and uh, used as comedy fodder, really there. And we have a number of rape jokes in Borat. Of course, the point of them is very different, but nowadays it might be hard to even try to find a point of view on that subject for guys to make fun of. So that's something you might be approaching very. I'm not saying you couldn't deal with the same controversial subjects or new controversial subjects, but you always have to find an angle that sort of works that makes it palatable. And oftentimes, uh, do you think that oftentimes comedy is an expression of the time that you're living in and that sometimes it doesn't stand the test of time because the angle that you've found for the joke or what you're talking about is solely sort of an expression of that moment? That is always a danger with comedy. Comedy does often have a temporary shelf life. That's very, very true. Look at what's going on in the country right now. This is a very good example of that, actually. The country itself is so fragmented. There's so many different factions, and comedy reflects that. There's a lot of different voices in comedy that are in direct contrast to other voices. There are people that love Louis C.K. still, but there are people that loathe him. There are people that think Hannah Gatsby's funny and people who don't. So all those dif different disparate groups exist like they do in the society. And what you hope for is at some point down the line, it'll be like a dialectic, and it'll be a synthesis of all those voices, and it'll create a new American comic voice of some kind. And then that synthesis will break, and we'll have exactly. to another it's synthesis. Exactly, the, the waves, exactly. Yeah, yes. uh, you know, you, you mentioned the, um, the, the Native American women that you interview in this. Uh, the, the comedians, and I love that section of the film, and one of the things that I love so much about it is that as much as everybody is funny in this, this is a very earnest exploration of people looking for comedy in destitute places, not just dangerous, but destitute places. Yes. And the, um, the life of Native Americans in this country is rarely explored and discussed, and it is one often of destituteness, and they find the humor in it. What made you want to, to go to them? Well, I, I, there was a, I was looking for people that are oppressed, and who, um, whose situations are not funny at all on the surface. 
and trying to find the humor in those situations around the world. And here, Native American comedians really are dealing with that. They're kind of been forgotten. They still are, people feel completely comfortable insulting Native Americans still. We see, we see all the team names, the Kansas City Chiefs, the Cleveland Indians, the Atlanta Braves. We saw when the Kansas City Chiefs almost made the Super Bowl, the, everybody doing, you know, the chop, oh, yeah, 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 you know, that whole thing, and they play the drum, and they wear the head. You know, this is, this is offensive to an entire group of people, but we don't care. We don't seem to care. Just recently, the Covington kids mm -hmm. confronted that guy, and you know, it was covered as if it was somehow his fault, ultimately, uh, the, the Native American man, you know? Um, so, so it's- it like, uh, What about our boys? Right, exactly. What, what about them? So this tremendous amount of casual, mm -hmm. institutional, cultural racism towards Native Americans in this country, how do they survive? They are broken people, they are forgotten people, they are the victims of genocide, and yet they have comedy. And I, that seemed valuable to me. Now you're looking for oppressed people, and I guess we'll just stick to the sort of the, the America episode right now. Okay. And within that, you also look for those who think that they're oppressed and hunt for comedy in the thought that they're oppressed. And those are the alt-right. And you interview yes. uh, a guy by the name of Baked Alaska yes. and a guy by the name of Andrew Orenheimer, otherwise known as, as Weave, who I've had some contact with myself. Right. Um, what made you want to talk to members of the alt-right? Or when did you start to notice, because I think I've noticed this as well, that the alt-right was finding their own comedic language? Well, I, I'm a big uh, proponent and uh, sort of, uh, I have a massive curiosity about anti-comedy. Um, and I remember when I was a little kid, uh, Alan Abel used to pull off these pranks and these hoaxes. Uh, when I got a little bit older, Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, the Yippies used to stage these happenings and these events, and they were meant to piss off the establishment, essentially, you know? Then later on, that was kind of picked up on by Andy Kaufman, who I had the good fortune of working with a couple of times, and he took it to that next level. It really made a performance art out of stand-up comedy, not being funny, being the funny thing. How unfunny can you be and it still be funny? So he would get up on stage, I don't know if people realize this, he used to get up on stage, Andy Kaufman, and he would start reading The Great Gatsby, page after page, until people were booing, until finally everyone left and he would keep going. When we used to do Seinfeld, Okay, we would go to a place called Jerry's Deli, which is right next to the studio, after the show, after we taped the show. And in LA. In LA, in Studio City. And Andy used to do a shift as a busboy at Jerry's Deli. He would just work a shift as a busboy, and he would never break character. He wouldn't, you know, like, hey, Jerry, hey, Larry, what's going on, man? No, he would bust the table. And he would do that every week. We saw him week after week after week. He's there, he's busting the tables. So he had made this commitment to this kind of conceptual comedy. I really admired that. He was doing it in the real world, you know? He was not afraid of uh, failure, rejection, humiliation. Um, so he was a very admirable character. And I thought that form of comedy has kind of gotten lost by the left. And now the alt-right see themselves as the oppressed victims and the neoliberal establishment as the power structure. And so they, a lot of their point of view to me is not ideology, but really about pissing off yeah. the people in power. And they don't really care about the issues so much. They may be racist and sexist and all those things, yes. But I don't think they care. So I think they care about pissing people off and making people angry. And I was very interested. Is that comedy? Can that be comedy? Can it be funny? How will it work? And that's what I wanted to explore. Did you find that it could be funny and that it could work? Well, we had talked uh, backstage about Sam Hyde. I was supposed to interview Sam Hyde. He had a show on that was virulently racist and sexist and graphically violent, but it also was kind of funny at times. And uh, I wanted to talk to him because he did seem to find some kind of weird balance, whoever he is. The problem was nobody admitted to really being Sam Hyde, which is part of the prank of the whole thing, right. part of the conceptual quality of it, you know. But yes, I was curious if uh, people could pull that off. And there aren't too many who are. And the mainstream media, of course, is not giving them 
any kind of platform, maybe rightfully so. I don't know. Well, I think what you also find though when you interview one of the one of the one of those guys that we're talking about is that the sort of hiding but there is a kind of hiding the actual ideology behind just doing these things for laughs or just doing these things to piss off the establishment. Yeah. Like one of the people that you interviewed is actually a working neo Nazi and is the editor of the Daily Stormer. Yes. And has like a swastika on his chest. Yes. And he actually does believe in white supremacy. Yes. Prior to sort of outing himself as someone who believed those things, he would say he was only doing it for lols or saying he was doing it to piss off the establishment. We see it's kind of a gateway drug in some way for far right ideologies. Well, you know, I try to uh, engage with him on a certain level and kind of even debate him at a certain point. Can't. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, he has a kind of a Tourette's like racism. And he went off on these harangues, these long harangues, and I just started to let him do it. And then I would kind of have a comment at the end or something like that, and that seemed to be the best way. You know, let's, let's hear what he has to say. If it makes sense to you, that's fine. I don't want to impose an interpretation on it, but it's, in, it's inevitable that people will make judgments about it, you know, and I want that to happen. So where, where did the, uh, the idea for Larry Charles's Dangerous World of Comedy come from? What made you want to explore oppressed places and, peop and find people who are uh, making comedy within them? Well, first of all, I'm a very lucky person. I've had a lot of good fortune in my life, and I'm very grateful for it. It's true. I, I, I see myself as lucky. It's true. First I mean, and foremost. I laugh because, like, you're, I mean, it's Seinfeld, Bruno, Bora, I, you know, the luck is just kind of... But, uh, yes, I, I, I admit I've done a lot of cool things. I, I'm glad. I'm very proud of that. But I also never forget the arbitrariness of life. And so I've been, you know, sometimes in the right place or I've been very resilient and kept going when I should have given up or I did things that I then that I would never do now, reckless things to try to get jobs and things like, you know. I, ask for an example of that? Well, I mean, I, I didn't know how to break into show business. I had no idea. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know what to do or how to start. So I started writing jokes on a, and this is in the 70s, on a piece of legal paper, um, handwriting jokes. And I was a parking valet in Los Angeles. And I used to go after work to the comedy store with my handwritten jokes. And when I see a comedian, I would go, hey, you want to buy a joke? And guys started buying my jokes. And one of those guys, you know, Jay Leno, all these people started buying my jokes. They got to know me as a guy who had good jokes. And one of those guys got uh, cast on a TV show and recommended me. And then I, got, I actually talked my way into that. I hitchhiked to the interview and, uh, you know, to, you know, kind of uh, impress them enough to get hired on that show. So I went from being a parking valet to a TV writer, which was a gigantic leap. And it just was like, you know, I would never, if I thought about what I was doing, I probably would never have done that. You know, I didn't think about how crazy it was or how, what a long shot it was, but it worked out. So, you know, I, I see the arbitrariness and the randomness of that. I got lucky, you know. So uh, can I ask? I did have good jokes though. I, be, I mean, I believe that you had yeah. good jokes, because then your writing career was incredible after that. Seinfeld, Kirby, Enthusiasm, uh, Borat. Uh, when you talk about being crazy and not thinking about it, was there an element of that when you were making Borat as well? Well, and uh, Borat is actually uh, one of the things that I, I like to think uh, uh, sort of inspired this, in a way. Because we, we went to um, all these different countries, and including America, of course, and uh, created mayhem and havoc and we get to leave, and we get to come home to America, and we get rewards, we get accolades. It's really amazing uh, the benefits of creating havoc overseas. But everywhere I went, I met comedians. And I thought, what happens to those guys when we leave? There are these oppressive regimes, religious governments. You know, what do they do under those conditions on a full-time basis? And I, it, it sort of started to percolate in my mind, and I became curious, and I started to Google the most dangerous places I could think of, and comedy. And I would go Iraq in comedy, and Somalia in comedy, and Syria, and every time comedians came up. There were always comedians in all these countries. And I thought, that's a fascinating thing. How do you survive as a comedian in Somalia? That seemed like a massive question, you know? And then I became curious about what makes extremists laugh, you know? And then I thought, wow, if I could talk to a terrorist, and talk to them about what makes them laugh or what makes ISIS laugh, that would be a very interesting conversation and maybe illuminating in some way, who knows? It was a fascinating conversation because it was like watching someone talk about comedy without laughing at all, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's like we would do this and it would be funny. <laughs> right. And there's like a very sad, yeah. stern yeah. look. Well, I had a theory about it because uh, even with, Buck, with Butt Naked, um, 
you know, I remember my sound guy going, why are we talking to this guy? He's a child murderer, you know? General Butt Naked is a, um, uh, a Liberian general who fought during the Civil War and uh, while fighting uh, would um, eat children and eat some of the enemy. He was, uh, called, he was called Buck Naked because he Buck fought... Buck or Butt? Butt Naked, sorry. Buck okay. Naked was actually the George character in the episode that I wrote, um, the, uh, the outing. Um, but um, Butt Naked was a... Uh, a general, as you say, uh, in the uh, Liberian Civil War, and he actually fought naked. That was his thing. He and his men would take off their clothes and fight naked because they believed that the bullets would not pierce them if they were naked. And he managed to talk all these child soldiers into doing that. So there's great pictures of these, you know, imagine having like 20 guys running at you naked. You know, you might surrender right then without even firing a shot. What happens so. when someone gets shot, though? Do you still carry the belief that the bullet won't pierce you when they you did something wrong? They didn't need, you know, he used to, uh, and, and this is the truth. Oh, right. It would be this that individual's problem, right? That's right. I mean, they used to, before they would go out to fight, this is what he did the, the murdering, uh, uh, the child murders. He would, the children would be used as ritual sacrifices for the battle. You know, they were going to take off their clothes, they were going to fight this, but in order to win the battle, they needed to do this ritual. And the ritual in that case, and this is true, was murdering an innocent child. Then, if that's not bad enough, removing their heart raw and making each child soldier eat a piece of that heart. And that bonded them in a very perverse way. And that's, that's who buck naked was incredible <laughs> team building exercises yes he he it, all very unique that's yeah. all in his book along with the cookbook he's Take writing notes on. ceo yeah, of yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah yeah the human flesh cookbook he's working on also now <laughs> um but so that's that's who he was and uh, i thought you know terrorism these things that we have uh, knee-jerk reactions to these horrible acts of violence you know that's the end result of terrorism you know but how does it begin what were the childhoods like? And I talked to him about his childhood. And you hear a very weirdly abusive childhood that he went through. The ISIS guy was basically, you know, ISIS came through his village and kidnapped everybody, you know. The Al-Shabaab terrorist that I spoke to, the defector, you know, he was tricked. But that's what he says. He was tricked by Al-Shabaab into believing it was more of a religious organization than a violent organization. And, uh, you know, all these guys have more to the story than we, we think of this kind of face of ISIS in black and yelling death to America. But there, and there are some obviously psychotic people there as there are in the American military, but a lot of the guys are kind of sucked into it and aren't even thinking about what they're doing and have no choice, their families are being threatened. In the case of the Liberian child soldiers, quite often the families are murdered right in front of the kids and then they take the kids and make them soldiers. Yes, what was harder for you uh, as the, essentially, for lack of a better word, the reporter in this, was it hard to reserve your judgment morally or reserve your judgment as a, a sort of comedy nerd or someone who's worked in comedy for so many years? Because some of the comedy that you come into contact with, on the face of it, is not the best, right. <laughs> the best comedy. Right, right. Well, first of all, I, you know, I have to say, I went in with certain expectations and a certain agenda, and that was upended very quickly, and in a good way. I mean, I wanted to discover. I didn't want to know what was going to happen. But I thought I would get a lot of very hard-edged government critiques in these countries dealing with the corrupt governments and the terrorists, and there is a lot of that. And people put themselves on the line to do that kind of political humor. But I was really struck by how people are, have a higher calling with their comedy there. You know, the comedy path in Iraq or Somalia is not, oh, I'm going to do a pilot, I'm going to get a stand-up tour, and I'm going to do movies. You know, it's, it's I'm going to maybe live. That's what I'm trying to do is just live. I'm trying to heal the country. I'm trying to make things better here. So it's a higher calling, and they're willing to die for that cause. And comedy then is a primal force in that. Play the fool, as uh, as two women say, which is right. my favorite version of how anyone has ever described comedy, which is, it's great, we get to play the fool. Yeah, the play time. the fool, yes. Yeah. And for them, that, has, as she said, that worked out. Well, I think about the um, the vets, that the American vets that yes. you interview, who have, uh, one of them has a show called Vet TV, right? Yes. Where he has a number of shows. Now, the clips that you showed, I personally saw those, and I was like, oh, I don't think that's, I actually don't think this is funny, and I think this is kind of offensive. Yes. And it's some, it can be hard to offend me, but there was something about, that and specifically that 
kind of I had a knee jerk reaction to. Did you have that with any of the people that you were interviewing about their comedy, or were you able to consistently like keep that at at an arm's length? Well, first of all, as a comedy filmmaker, for lack of a better term. I am looking for the moment, okay? I am looking for that moment when, boom, I catch what I'm looking for, you know? Most of the stuff we do at Borat uh, it, with Sasha is one-take comedy. You do, the, you do the scene. If the scene works out, great, you have the scene. If the scene doesn't work out, you have to pick up stakes and go to a different city and do it all over again, you know? So you want to get it in that one take, and that's the only chance you get. Same thing here, I, you know, I wasn't gonna go back and do retakes with Somali comedians or with, with Butt Naked, you know? So I, I really, I like to capture that moment. When Butt Naked said to me, you know, after talking about murdering that last child, I asked him what makes him laugh today, and he told me Bill Cosby's kids say the darndest thing. I mean, I was kind of secretly elated because it's like, well, I cannot believe he just talked about a child murder, and then that's his favorite show. So you're looking for those kind of, I mean, that's what I was looking for, those kind of moments. So I'm not offended by it, and I'm not judging him even, but I want you to see it and see what you think. Well, I guess not it's necessarily. It's an unbelievable moment, and I want to share that with you. Yeah, I mean, it has a lot to say. It's less funny and more about the compartmentalization of our actions and how you can do something absolutely brutal, be brought up in a brutal way, but still at the same time have an affinity for children, have an affinity for yeah. human beings in life, while at the same time think, no, but these lives have to die for this other reason. We're yeah. confounding species. We're a very contradictory species, and that's a, a, a perfect illustration of it. But what about when it came to comedy, like just judging the comedy on the face of it? Is this a good, is this a well-written joke? Well, that is an interesting question. I mean, I think most, you know, first of all, the foundation for all comedy everywhere I went, whether it's the Middle East or Africa, is Western comedy. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows Eddie Murphy. Everybody knows Dave it's Chappelle. It's so crazy because they say that comedy doesn't travel globally, at least they, in industry. -wise. Not so anymore. Not so, first of all, Sasha is one of the first people to break that. Borat was as, as successful overseas one of the first American comedies that was possibly more successful overseas than it was even in the States. And Eddie Murphy's movies, and you know, there's quite a few movies now that play really well in other countries, you know? Um, so there is a global audience for Western humor. That's what is the foundation for all modern humor around the world. So people are very appreciative of that, but they are using it as the role model, and they're building their own version of it. So it is much more um, rough, primitive, uh, not as uh, refined yet. Um, in a lot of places like Lagos, it's like sort of doing humor that was being done here 10 years ago and maybe not as well, you know, warmed over. But some people are just funny regardless and other people, no matter what, are not. So it really depends on the individual. Some people will just make me laugh even if I don't understand what they're saying. I've directed commercials like in Thailand where I didn't understand what they were saying but I knew this guy was funny. You could just tell, you could feel it, you know. There was a, I believe it's in Somalia, the group of guys, you interview one man in a magazine, he's like in a, a magazine or a video store or something like right, that. Right, right, uh, Paul the, Flomo. The clips of his work I thought were really funny. Right. And I had no idea what was happening to them. Exactly. And what they were talking about, but I just thought that the spirit of it was, was extremely it's the funny. The same with me. Now again, uh, uh, he, he is the perfect example. Both those guys actually, uh, Angel Michael and Paul Flomo, the Liberian comedians, who don't make any money by the way. You know, they have to have jobs, and then from their jobs, they make these little videos and put them on social media. But both those guys are just legitimately funny guys. They're very, very funny, and that's, it was good to meet people like that, to see that that exists. And when you say some of the humor is 10 years behind, I think you're referencing the Nigeria episode, yeah. where a lot of the sexual politics are uh, yeah, about 10 years behind Right, stuff we, were, stuff we were arguing about a generation ago. Which basically. is crazy to think that only 10 years ago we were arguing, we were having this conversation. That's the revelation of that. Not so much that they're mired in it right now because they're looking for a way out and the women comedians in Nigeria are very conscious of it and fighting back against it. But that we, are, you know, we who are so quick to judge are not that far ahead, really, you know. So there's four episodes of this. Yeah. Um, is there going to be, is, is there a, an intention to make more, to travel more, or was this just kind of like, the, you got it out? Well, first of all, I went to a lot of other countries that we weren't able to use here. I went to Turkey. I tried to get to Syria. I couldn't get into Syria. Uh, I went to Palestine, which I did an amazing segment 
an amazing comedian named Adi Khalifa in Palestine that I profiled, I met his family, and he does a children's comedy workshop in Nazareth for kids who are traumatized by the war, you know? And you meet, it's so inspiring. I mean, first of all, he's the sweetest person in the world, but you meet these kids in all these countries, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, wherever it is, you know, these, these countries that are, that are producing terrorism, but you meet the kids, and the kids are the same as American kids. They're sweet, they're innocent, they want to play, you know what I mean? And something, their families get wiped out, they get bombed out, they have to run for their lives. I mean, what do you expect to happen with these children, you know? And so he was an inspiring example of somebody trying to fight against that. We have this image of Palestinians, or ISIS, or all these groups as being these monolithic hate groups, but it's not like that at all. It's much more complicated. We get a very superficial view of so many of these issues in the United States. So are these things that you think could make it into another? So yes, I, I, unfortunately, it's still a dangerous world. You know, I mean, there's constantly new danger zones opening up. Wars are breaking out constantly. Venezuela is a place I would go to. Yemen is a place I would go to. I would go to Syria if they would let me in this time. Um, I think there's always, unfortunately, countries that are under tremendous duress where comedy still exists and survives and thrives and serves a very important social force. Do you, look, do you ever look back on your career and are just kind of fascinated by the track that it took? Well, I try, you know, like I've worked with Bob Dylan. I, I did yeah, a, I, sort of, yeah, yeah. From like and, Seinfeld and, to Bob Dylan. And I'm not, being, I don't want to name drop, but he has an expression, don't look back. And people will come up to him and go, remember when you were, went electric at Newport? And, all? and he go, no, nah, I don't remember. You know, and I thought, you know, at first I thought he was just being annoying about that, but really he doesn't want to be trapped. Everybody else is trapped in, in a, a preconceived notion of who he is and what he is, and he's kind of compete with his younger self, and it's, it's very, so I try not to look back at my work, I don't watch, Anything that I've, I've never watched Borat again after I was done with it. I don't watch the Seinfelds anymore. You know, I don't watch anything that I've done anymore. And I haven't really, I've had to watch this a million times to edit it, but I don't watch it now anymore. And so uh, I, I think that for myself, I didn't want to, um, you know, be too self-conscious about it, I guess. Yeah, I guess the question is not so much about looking, go, actually going back and watching your work or reliving the, the glory days or anything, but just the sort of weird twists and well, turns I, I will I will tell you that, uh, as I said, I don't think about it, except when I've been doing, like, for instance, this little publicity thing. And some jerk off like me brings it up to you. No, <laughs> it's not that you bring it up, but when I'm introduced, they, you have to invariably sort of list my credits. And I don't think of the credits in that kind of conglomerate thing that aggregate the way you do when you introduce me and you kind of list those things, it's a litany of credits. And I'm usually like, wow, did I do all that? I, it's like, I almost can't believe it. It almost doesn't feel like me. I'm very detached from it in some weird way. Right. Yeah, and that's, but that's the only time I really think about it is when I hear these introductions before I come out. It's like the process ends and you move on. I do move on, yeah. I don't cling to it. And that's why I'm not into, re that's why I'm doing this instead of doing reboots or sequels or things like that, stuff that I do get offered that I'm just not interested in. I want to keep pushing forward. Uh, we have a couple questions from the audience, right uh, here. Hi. Hi there. Um, so how much preparation had to go into doing this? Like, did you know what um, you were kind of aiming to do beforehand, or, or did it just kind of go um, as you were filming it? You can't um, do this stuff haphazardly. Um, everything, I, I'm not a reckless person. I don't want to die. I have no interest in getting hurt or being imprisoned or tortured. I wouldn't, I wouldn't survive it. Um, so I didn't want to get into trouble, but I wanted to go to these trouble spots. In order to do that, you have to do a lot of preparation. I did a ton of research. We had a research team. We did a ton of research on all the countries and all the people we were trying to see. Uh, we had to go through the State Department to get permission to go to places like Saudi Arabia or Somalia. I tried to get into Syria. The State Department wouldn't let us. So I, but I thought when we'll go to Somalia, I thought they'll say no to that. But they said yes, and I was like, what? So now I had to go to Somalia, and that was pretty freaky. You have to get all these vaccinations. I mean, these, these like prosaic, you know, sort of concerns. I had to get like six vaccinations, you know, and take malaria pills and all that kind of stuff too, which I wasn't in the mood to do. So take the malaria pills. Yeah. Did you have the nightmares? 
No, I don't think I ever slept. Oh, really? <laughs> Larry pills give you like insane. Wow, wow. Yeah. Like lucid, yeah. lucid. I have nightmares. nightmares anyway. So when I finally do, <laughs> when I reach the REM sleep, which is rare, I get nightmares anyway. So there was a lot of preparation that went into it. However, once you get there, it's a brand new ball game. People don't show up. Things aren't the way they were planned. And you have to be able to pivot and be flexible. And I shoot in such a way that it allows me to do that. I keep a very small crew. We had a, one camera, a sound man, two producers, and myself. And so we could be in a van. And if I wanted to stop and jump out and shoot B-roll or talk to somebody in you know, the street, I could do that. And so I was also able to get a lot more stuff than I ever imagined also. You know, I, I feel like it's probably just because you only had one camera and that was probably because you were trying to be economical while you were shooting. But that also led to you never being on camera. That's on purpose. That is on purpose. Yes. Because I, I embrace that, not because I don't want to see your, you on camera, <laughs> but uh, simply because you didn't make it about you at all. Yeah, you I were didn't want... the story. I didn't want to hire a host... You were telling it. Too. Yeah, I didn't want to hire a host who then had to kind of do a performance. I wanted it to be as stripped down and authentic as possible. And I thought of myself as kind of the Werner Herzog of comedy, you know? I thought, like, you know, he's not on camera, but he's driving the thing. And I thought I could do, I, I knew I could do that, you know? And that's what, that's what I sort of intended. I mean, occasionally I get on camera, obviously. And, we're, and we only do have one camera, and that was on purpose, because I wanted that camera also to stay alive. You know, and I didn't want to get reverse shots. I didn't want it to look like other interviews. I wanted it to look very distinctive, you know? And I'm right there, and I'm asking the questions, and you're seeing my hand fly around or whatever, and sometimes I'm on camera, but the intention was for me not to be on camera very much and to really focus on what we were looking at. The first thing you ever directed was Curb Your Enthusiasm, yes. right? And then you go on to Borat and Bruno, and you have since made a few uh, pretty straight, I don't want to say straightforward, but narrative films. Yes. Got reverse shot, actors acting. And yes. Um, and now you've come back to this. Are you more comfortable? Do you like shooting in a more improvisational, handheld, sort of like things could change in the moment, very flexible way? Do yes, I, I much prefer that. I mean, I, I felt that the, I had reached a disillusionment with that feature filmmaking apparatus. It's a gigantic operation. It's like, it's like an army, you know, and I prefer like a guerrilla band. You know, I prefer a small amount of people that we could just do what we want to do. When you have that many people, you also have executives. You also, we had too many writers, too many executives, too many producers, too many cooks. And then you have to hope that the marketing works out. And there's so, and there's so much, it's immoral how much money is squandered on these things. And that bothered me also. So I wanted to get away from all that. I, it's, it didn't bring me satisfaction. And in the end, I didn't have control over the finished product. And I was dissatisfied with it. Wow. So the whole thing, I mean, other than the fact that it's extremely lucrative and you are treated like a king <laughs> in that situation, which I wanted to get rid of both those things. I didn't, I wanted to do something that had some urgency to it that could cut through some of the bullshit instead of add to it. That said, you did get to work with Nicolas Cage, who is the most, uh, I think, I wouldn't say uncompromising, but you have to pivot a lot, I think, when you're working with him as a director. He's, but that's what I like. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I loved working with Nick Cage, just like I loved working with Sasha. It was very similar in that he was in the moment completely and uh, gave everything with every take. He was an amazing guy. I really loved him. Uh, I think we have a couple more questions. Larry, thanks so much for being here, man. My pleasure. I'm going to be the annoying guy that Ricky mentioned and ask about a film that I'm a huge fan of called Masked and Anonymous. Yes, sir. That you uh, co-wrote with Bob Dylan, who you mentioned. That was about 15 years ago. How do you think it stands up today, considering all the social unrest in this country and the kind of apocalyptic vibe that's going on? And do you have any positive memories of making that film? I have only positive memories of making that film. Um, that was an incredible, lucky, again, a lucky experience. I was called up to, um, would I be interested in meeting Bob Dylan? He's interested in doing a TV project. So I was like, of course, you know? And what I thought was, I'll go meet Bob Dylan, and then I can go back and brag to my friends that I met Bob Dylan. I never thought it would go any further than that, and I went to see him that first time, and he has a little cubicle in this boxing gym that he owns, and I sat in the boxing gym in the cubicle with him, and he had a box, a beautiful embossed box, and he opened the box, and there was all the scrap paper in it, and he dumped it out on the table, and he said, I don't know what to do with this. So I started looking at the scrap papers and it had like a name on it or it had like a line, like a, po a line of a poem or something. 
And I said, well, you know, you could take this, this could be a name of a character. And you could take this, and this could be a line of the dialogue. He's like, you could do that? And I'm like, yeah. And we started writing. Can I ask, how much of you was, how much of that was you inspired by those names? Or you being like, well, if I bullshit my way through this, we can write a movie together or do something. <laughs> I don't see any distinction between those two things. Smart, good answer, good answer, yeah. <laughs> To me, it's all the same. Um, <laughs> So we worked on that, and we worked on what it was, what it became uh, initially, was he had been on tour and had been watching Jerry Lewis movies on the bus, okay? And he loved the Jerry Lewis movies. He wanted to do something like a slapstick comedy for like HBO that he would star in. That was the original plan. And we wrote that, and we went to HBO, and we sold it. And so we were gonna make this slapstick comedy with Bob Dylan. Did you ever shoot the pilot of that? No, because oh. we came out of the meeting, we were all elated, and Bob seems very morose. What's, what's the matter, Bob? I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> we just sold it five minutes ago. What do you mean you don't want to do it anymore? It's too slapsticky. So he bailed on that, and everybody else that we were with, our managers, and they, they all told me to get out then. And I was like, man, I'm on the Bob Dylan train. I'm not getting off. I'll take this wherever it goes right now. And so we went back in the room, back into the cubicle, and we reworked the material to become Mastin Anonymous. And it became like sort of this mythological, Shakespearean, biblical, I call it like an apocalyptic spaghetti western musical, you know? So I think it's, I think it's, first of all, the version that you see that's available is the cut down version. I, my original cut is three and a half hours. And it's a much more pageant-like movie. It's got a lot more music in it, a lot more scenes, a lot more actors. It's a very cool thing that I hope someday can come out. The music is amazing in it also. But eventually they were, it was such a surreal, unmarketable movie in a way that they came in with a great editor, a guy named Pietro Scalia, who had won an Oscar with Bertolucci, and he cut with me, we cut down the three and a half hour version to the two hour version that exists now. So that's a good version of it, and it does resonate, and I do think it holds up, unlike a lot of comedy, Bob, Bob Dylan, look, let's face it. Bob Dylan holds up. He's one of the few people that will survive. His, his work is, one of the few, is, is amongst the, 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 the work that will survive this century and move on to the next century. Very few people have that ability, you know? So I think the movie has that quality. It's part of his body of work as well as mine, and it's got a lot of things going on. It's a very dense piece. It's very satisfying. For people that see it, they usually respond very positively to it. But there was an initial kind of, oh, Bob Dylan's mumbling in a movie again, and people, Roger Ebert actually gave it a terrible, he panned it at uh, Sundance. It was the centerpiece premiere at Sundance, and he panned it. And the reason he panned it, in my opinion, was he came backstage at Sundance and wanted to meet the actors because Jessica Lange, John Goodman, Jeff Bridges, they, Luke, Luke uh, you know, Wilson, they all came out for the premiere, and he wanted to take pictures with them. And so he took pictures with all of them, they were very gracious and cordial with him, and then he wanted to take a picture with Bob. And Bob was like, no, I'm not taking any picture. And he wouldn't take the picture with Roger Ebert, and then the next day we got, we got panned. Uh, now, maybe it was legitimate pan, but it did happen that way. And so the movie stumbled out of the gate immediately. It was like a public failure right off the bat. And look, Bob's had a lot of, I've had a lot of those, but Bob's had so many public failures, it doesn't mean anything to him. You know, so that's the movie. That's what happened to it, and that's its fate right now. It'll be rediscovered because Bob Dylan is a very important person in the culture. People will go back and examine it at some point down the line, I hope. I'm curious, was it your work with Bob Dylan and the way that they reached out to you, what made the Kanye West collaboration happen? Very similar, very similar. They came to me uh, and asked if I'd be interested in working with Kanye on a, a pilot for HBO. And I was like, hell yeah. I, I would, you know, again, I'll meet him. Let's meet. I can't imagine that it'll work out. You know, let's just meet and you know, that'll be interesting to meet Kanye. And this was like just before like Jesus Walks and all that, so very early still. But he was already a star. And I met with him and the first thing he said to me, and this is the truth, he said, I'm the black Larry David. <laughs> and I was like, really? How are you the black? And he started telling me story after story of him stepping in shit and putting his foot in his mouth and having to apologize all the time and fucking up one time after another. And it was a show. 
I could see the show right away. Him, his entourage, these funny situations that he really got himself into, and I, I, we made the pilot. You know, JB also... Smooth plays his manager, as a matter of fact. Oh wow, I didn't realize. Oh, it's that. such a, it's a really funny pilot. It's great, and for some reason HBO didn't pick it up. But that is so funny, though. That I mean, and I, I'm a person who loves Kanye's music. Uh, and, like, it is so funny to think of how big an ego is to be like, "Oh, I am Larry David too," <laughs> because everybody watches Curb Your Enthusiasm, right. and what works about it is that you relate to Larry David, yes. and you feel like, "Oh, I could have done that too." Yeah. But to be powerful and successful enough to be like, "I'll make that show about me." Yeah, I'm the Black Larry David. I own that now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Larry he was actually he was great. I, I really enjoyed working with him. He was very sweet. Um, how his life has gone since then, I, I don't even want to judge it. I don't know what the reality is. But he was a great guy. He was great to work with. I really enjoyed it. You know, so you do explore America a little bit in this, but uh, I believe, and I'm paraphrasing here, a line that you say, you're talking about people going to the voting booth in another country, and you say, um, you talk about civil war and unrest on the way to the voting booth, and you say, it's not the way voting happens in America. Yet. Yet, right. Is there a part of you that believes that you will be within 10 years or so making a kind of different sort of dangerous world of comedy documentary but about America? Well, I could see it. Let's put it that way. I don't know if that, I could see that as one scenario for sure. In the quantum scenarios of, of uh, fate for America, the, the civil war, the multifactional civil war breaking out with all these divisive groups uh, sort of fending for themselves finally, and, you know, we're just bringing, the country feels like right now it's in a very bad place, heading to a possibly worse place. So I could see that being a scenario where America becomes like a lot, of, it, it is becoming in reality like a lot of these other countries. It, there, we talk about economic prosperity while people are starving, and you know, it, there's just so much contradiction in this American society, and so many different groups that can't possibly unify behind one thing anymore that I don't know where it's going to wind up going. And so, yes, I can see that. And that's why I wanted to at least spend some time in America talking to people under those conditions. Well, Larry, um, I love the series. Congratulations. Thank I love you. your work. Thank you so Thank much you. for being here. It's been an honor to have you on the stage. It was great. Uh, Dangerous Old Comedy is on Netflix now. It's absolutely fantastic. And give Larry Charles a big round of applause. Let's hear it. Thank you, Thank you very much.